We talk about top 10 trees for whitetails, wildlife, top five trees, things like that. And really, what I like to plant and utilize the most are shrubs. And uh, shrubs are different, you know. Shrubs provide that necessary side cover, for example. Deer live around and crave side cover. Side cover produces food sources, but it produces visual screening. For example, side cover can be in the form of hardwood regeneration. You can't see through it, so it's some type of cover. But when it, once it gets older and it's pole timber, you can see right through, it's not really offering much cover. Some of the high hinge cuts that people have been made and they've been made popular for quote bedding areas, you can see right under them. I've been on canopy hinge cuts where they're six feet off the ground, they're on a knoll somewhere, and you can sit in that knoll and look for 200 yards in any direction. That's not a bedding area. It doesn't provide any cover for wildlife, small game, and certainly not deer because they need that side cover. Shrubs provide side cover. And if they're browsable shrubs, then they provide food for the long term. They're always there. Deer can feed on them. They can live within them. Birds, nesting birds, rabbits, pheasant cover, escape cover. So there's a lot that goes into a shrub, and that's why I love planting shrubs. Uh, for wildlife and especially when it comes to deer even more than trees i think trees get all the glamour sometimes you talk about the big oaks and quick producing oaks or chestnut trees whatever it might be when really shrubs cannot power out power them all and that's why early successional growth areas old field growth where you have that early successional growth is home to pheasants rabbits deer birds it's very very diverse and they all include shrubs and that's why i love shrubs and it might not get the attention that trees get but uh, shrubs deserve a lot more attention these are some of my favorites right here i starred my personal favorites right here including bushes and, and willows but number one red osier dogwood i talk about red osier dogwood because if you have it it's easy very easy to manage you can mow it down it grows back deer love it taste it yourself during the dead of winter can be very cold and you can still take a red osier dogwood branch and bend it probably bend it around your wrist when you peel it back when you peel back that fresh layer of red bark it exposes a green growth underneath that you can actually chew on and taste it's almost like a tea it doesn't taste that bad it actually tastes almost like apple it's not bad it's something that I encourage you to try if you have it, but it's something you can maintain. The problem with red osier dogwood, it's a great shrub to plant for deer, but deer love to eat it. And so it's hard to establish. You have to establish most of these shrubs in cages. Make sure the deer cannot get to them or your dollars are your way. You're better off spending money to plant 20 shrubs and do it right and have them caged in, making sure they're protected, than you are to buy 500 like I've done in the past, back in the mid 90s, and had none of them survive because you did it all wrong. They're exposed to deer, wrong type of soil, didn't control weeds. Again, try to get 20 to grow correctly instead of 500 to grow incorrectly, and you'll be a lot further further ahead. And it'll make you want to keep adding more every year and adding to your habitat. Routers or dogwoods are a really good one. And, and probably because it's, I don't have a label as one of my favorites, is because it just gets browsed upon so easily. So most people that I recommend two or a few people here all red osier dogwood online they're easy to take cuttings from they're easy to plant but so many people do it incorrectly so that they're exposed to deer and browse pressure and they never they never live so it's almost like soybeans you know soybeans aren't one of my favorite food plot varieties but they are one of the food plots i see planted that get um that are, that that provide the biggest failure for food plotters because they're eating down in the dirt before the season begins. And if the red orger dogwood, you could have these great shrubs, spend a lot of money on them. And if they're eating down to the dirt and they're not growing, they're not doing anybody any good. Number two, raspberry bushes. They can be prolific. You can cut them back. You get great berries from them and deer love them. Doesn't matter if it's blackberry, raspberry, black raspberry, whatever it might be. There's a lot of different varieties. And they're some of my favorite to have on the property because they're great cover for wildlife, pheasant escape cover, cover rabbits, browse and certainly deer browse and you can go out with a bowl on our property here you can't but i can and you can get a huge amount of blackberry raspberry for some ice cream so you can always have berries it's a really good snack i've been i remember a property in michigan his name was paul and uh, we were out on his property and we we for about 10 minutes at lunchtime we sat just picking and stuffing our face with blackberries it was awesome he had a recent cutover area where there's a lot of hinge cuts and a lot of berries grew in great to plant um, there's areas like places like cold stream farms that uh, provide or, or sell blackberry raspberry bushes um, so you know a lot of choices out there 
for, uh, for planting them in a great addition to your property and they're very tolerant of over browsing too. Of course willow. Willow are great because they grow fast. They're not really soil dependent. They do like moist soil. They'll grow in wet soil sometimes. So while most of these, even if they're moisture loving, that doesn't mean you can plant them in deep water. Expect them to grow or have it be flooded for a month and a half in the spring and expect them to make it through. Now if they're already established in a dry year, then they'll make it through. So I encourage you to plant if you want to plant a thousand in the area and there's a chance of it being too wet, plant a hundred, get them established first, try another year, try another year, and that way you spread out your risk and, uh, and you'll be rewarded with at least some growth one year or another. Now there's a couple different types. Silky dogwood is what I have planted out by the road here. Silky dogwood is not browsed by deer. So that makes it perfect. It grows fast into about a 12 by 12 shrub. It's great for screening. And you'll notice a lot of my favorites, you know, Raspberries are browse tolerant. Nine bark deer usually don't like them unless they're, they really need some food or unless they're picking on them next to a food plot location, an area where there's high deer traffic. But I like those shrubs because shrubs are great. They provide that side cover, nesting area for birds, small game, escape cover, but at the same time, if they're not browsed on. So red osier, it's that borderline where it's a great shrub, but they're browsed on heavy. Dappled willow, great hybrid, grows very quickly but deer love to eat it. So consider dappled more like red osier dogwood. I go through Tom Haas with Big Rock Trees. He sells cuttings. Great way to plant shrubs. We use landscaping matting. That's what we have out on the, out on the road here. And uh, makes it for, makes a great way to plant these shrubs. But again, you have to be very aware of how browse tolerant they are. Silky, browse tolerant, dappled, not. Nine bark, it's a great one that deer don't typically eat. But I know of northern areas where people planted in Wisconsin, Michigan, you get into areas where there's not a lot of deer, but there's not a lot of browse, then they're gonna pick on them. And depending on the location, they could destroy them like the red osier dogwood, but they're not that um, as attractive as red osier dogwood, even yellow twig dogwood or dappled willow. They're not as attractive. So it's a great choice for establishing the shrubs or a low shrub, might be a great option for under power lines the silkies are a great option for under power lines dappled. They're not going to grow that as opposed to an actual hybrid willow. That's an actual tree, uh, completely different. These are talking more shrubs right here. So nine bark's a good one, has flowers on it. It's good for wildlife, nesting birds. So it's another one that's very easy to get. You can get them at most conservation districts and you have a high success rate with them. Now, autumn olive is a controversial one. Uh, I'm not going to make the recommendation that you go out and buy autumn olive for your land. Unfortunately though, Autumn olive is here to stay. And I talk about this often. 10 acre field, someone in Michigan 15 years ago, they get paid to remove the autumn olive, plant hardwood tubes. The autumn olive in that 10 acres is full of wildlife, rabbits, pheasants, birds, deer, whatever it might be. And then in just one failed swoop, you just remove all the autumn olive, plant tree tubes of hardwoods. Five years later, there's no hardwoods because deer knocked them down, ate them all, they died. So now I have an empty field that once was full of wildlife and all those wildlife, if they don't have a place to go, they just die. They get hit on the road, eaten by predators. And I'm a wildlife person. So you have to make that balance sometimes of what you're doing. Yes, this might be an invasive, but if I remove this, I'm destroying wildlife cover, necessary to wildlife cover. In areas like Michigan, where you have areas that are flat, might be browsed over with high deer numbers, autumn olive is a good bush in some of those areas or shrub because deer don't eat it. Very high quality rabbit and escape cover for pheasants, nesting birds, you have a red berry. That's why they spread so easily because the red berry is prolific. Foresters don't like them, but these don't, don't make any mistake. This does not take over your hardwoods. In fact, when they're shaded out, they eventually die. So they're outcompeted by hardwoods. It's just not a native. I wouldn't encourage you to plant it, but make sure you manage it. And taking areas like that, 10 acres, you could have taken that area, hollowed out pockets, kill the autumn olive, plant something else, plant conifers, whatever you might, so that the wildlife has that cover. If you're going to replace the autumn olive, do it in stages so that you can take out chunks of autumn olive, plant something desirable, make sure it's established, and then take out the rest. Do it in thirds, whatever you might do. They even have red cedar eradication programs in areas like Missouri. And down there where red cedar is so prolific, up here it's more controlled just by 
the environment that it's planted in. Down there, they'll have eradication programs. They'll go in and remove 40 acres. Well, all the wildlife that related to that 40 acres is gone now, and you're killing that wildlife. So again, you have to make that balance from being making a smart decision, more of a smart strategic plan than just full force going in and removing all of it and killing that wildlife that was there, trying to replace it with something else that doesn't necessarily grow because there's nothing else there that's growing, so it gets picked on at a much higher rate than it would have if you would have just pocket cut locations like that. So same goes for autumn olive. And autumn olive, I've even seen property, I was on a property, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars planting shrubs and grasses in lowland areas on a wetlands restoration program in Michigan. So it was heavily managed, monitored, because a lot of money was spent, a lot of dollars spent. And all that would lay down, all of it was gone in the winter time. So there wasn't any cover out there. So the areas that did hold small game were autumn olive. So in, with the plan administrator talking to that individual, the landowner found the land, the administrator said, yeah, if you, if you move that autumn olive, we wouldn't suggest doing so because you're not gonna have wildlife on the property during the winter time. You're not gonna have sustainable populations. So in those few acres of autumn olive in the corner of the woods that he did have, he actually kept those and that was actually under the plan. They actually accepted that. So I think government and state agencies are getting a little bit wiser to that just instead of just blankly saying, just remove all, kill all, just in that robotic, non-thinking, non-strategic, wildlife harming mentality that was present in the past and prevalent in the past. So if you have it, learn to manage it. If you want to remove it, do it in stages so you're not killing wildlife. Because again, I don't know, you look at someone that chooses to destroy wildlife by replacing an invasive non-strategically, I'm not really favoring that person because I love wildlife. Honorable mention down here, northern bush honeysuckle. Now, before you start getting up in arms about that and autumn olive, northern bush honeysuckle, look it up. It's prevalent from Saskatchewan to Iowa and all the way over to the east. Native, it's a native northern bush honeysuckle. It's not Japanese honeysuckle. It's not Tatarian honeysuckle. It's actually a native. It's a very highly attractive shrub for wildlife. The leaves turn a beautiful brown, reddish color. They're eaten. There's bees that hit that. There's a certain kind of moth that hits that honeysuckle. So it's a necessary and important piece of native habitat within the entire northeast corner, 25% of the country. So be very careful when you're saying, well, honeysuckle is bad. Were you talking native, non-native? Do you know the difference? Look at it. Just look it up. I can say that I heard, and I think it's true, that most non-native honeysuckle, if you break a branch, it's hollow. If it's not, it's native. Even go beyond that and make sure you check and see what you have on your land. Make sure it's native or not. But in some cases, when I see honeysuckle growing in a hardwoods on some property, now I've been down in Ohio, where there's so much, because it's a southern area, there's so much honeysuckle, it's, na it's non-native, it's invasive. They can hardly walk through the property. It's destroying the natural environment and natural plants that should be growing there. In that case, very bad. In that case, I'd rather not own that piece because I buy the land for hunting and managing true deer habitat and wildlife habitat and managing wildlife and populations as opposed to either managing timber value or managing invasives. You can sometimes with buckthorn up in these areas in the north, for example, buckthorn doesn't have many uses. It might be a little bit of side cover, but it's not really providing much at all. And you can spend a lifetime trying to remove it. And at the end of your life, and you give up on it for three or four years, because you're inside more, you don't feel like removing it, all of a sudden it comes right back. So it can be very disheartening to spend decades trying to remove it. And, uh, and it really can be a, a labor of love and then hate because you're gonna get sick of it after a while because it's very difficult to remove completely. A lot of people say, you know, I have honey, I have a buckthorn on my property, how do I get rid of it? Well, there's a lot you can look up online, how do I get rid of um, buckthorn? And they're all partially work. And that's the problem with it. So do you buy the property, take care of wildlife or take care of invasives? I'm not saying not to try to move buckthorn move buckthorn, but um, it can be a, a lot of work to do so. Northern bush honeysuckle, it's a great honeysuckle plant that you can add, very native. I think the, one of the articles I looked up recently was from July of 2021, it was the University of Michigan um, article, and it was basically titled something along the lines of time to plant northern bush honeysuckle. And they talked about all the favors of it and all the at good positive attribu attributes of the native form of honeysuckle. Also yellow twig dogwood. I like red osier dogwood before yellow twig because red osier dogwood seems to be more attractive to deer 
and it grows into a more, a more full bush as opposed to long st uh, slender tips of the yellow twig dogwood. It's more of a, a porcupine on steroids if you look at it that way. It's just all these shoots coming up out of it where red osier dogwood forms more of a bush. And so I like red osier dogwood a little bit better, but it's also a great one to plant, especially if you're planting a large area, it would be great to plant both and have that diversity. So hope that makes sense with autumn olive. You know, that's always a controversial one. Uh, there's always a love hate with it, but I've literally been on properties in Michigan. If they didn't have autumn olive, they wouldn't have wild cover at all, wildlife cover at all, because they didn't have side cover. They didn't have bush cover. They had all open hardwoods. It's being managed under a timber plan. They can't cut any more than they already have. A lot of open cover and then you have this area of autumn olive that represents 15 acres out of their 160 acres and all the wildlife is focusing around that area if they remove that they're going to remove the wildlife so always consider that balance of what you're doing and you can even say like uh, you know you have to assess balance and everything how many does is enough because once you pass that perfect balance the number of does as it increases, the number of bucks go down. Another aspect to look at is, yeah, people don't want to use herbicides, but that means repeated tillings with big machinery. See, so you have weed-free plots because if you have weeds, why plant it? But that means you have to buy big machinery, heavy equipment. You have to repeatedly till over and over again. You're creating soil erosion. You're ruining that top layer of microorganisms and that top layer of topsoil that you're trying to develop over time by repeatedly. So no-till, using cover crops like we do with buckwheat or rye to limit weed growth, limit your herbicide use, and again, it's that balance. So try to assess the balance in everything you do. These are some awesome shrubs you can plant, add to your, your uh, wildlife mix, wildlife habitat, maybe without the autumn olive right here. And uh, you know, these right here, who knows, if you can get them all on your property, if you have them all there, great diversity. And some of these could be a replacement for your autumn olive. But make sure you're doing it in stages and not all at once. Make sure that you're providing diversity. And I think if you start going the shrub mount route more than the tree route, um, you'll find that you'll attract the most wildlife in general. Um, number of wildlife, different types of species on your land as opposed to trees. Not that you don't plant trees, but the bottom line is shrubs typically went out when it comes to wildlife and I hope you take advantage of some of these are my favorites going into the planting season this year and, and it's February right now it's time to get some orders placed so check out bigrocktrees.com they have some great ways great different varieties of shrubs to plant an easy way to plant them and they can really help you going throughout the growing season this year and into your hunting season this fall folks I want to make sure you check out my web class video series whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.